All right. I spent most of the week reading 1 John, thinking I was going to find a message in 1 John because in this epistle, John is writing to a church that is finding so much joy in the Word of God, and they are just wondering about all these different things. They want to know about angels and demons and how does salvation work, and you know, and they just want to dig into the scripture, but they really are going off in weird directions. And if you've ever read any of the Apocrypha, any of the pseudopigraphal works, like the works that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls or Nag Hammadi, you know that there is some really weird stuff out there in Christianity. And John was saying, now hold on. You want to know all these things, but you've forgotten what's fundamental. You've forgotten why you were called in the first place. It's not so you can understand the hierarchies of angels and demons. It's not so that you can come up with ways in which God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all this and all that. It's so that you can do the work of the Lord. And he says it's about loving one another. It's about brotherhood. It's about fellowship. And John is writing to bring them back to that central message. And he says over and over in his gospel, I give you a new command, not a new command, but one you've had from the beginning, that you love one another. And he reminds them that Jesus's work wasn't to tell us all about dragons and unicorns and satyrs and basilisks. And the one time a phoenix shows up in the Bible, although that's a fun Bible study that I really want to do again. <laughs> but that's not the point. It's that we do the work of our Father who sent us. And as I was reading this epistle, I realized it's not what I wanted to preach at all. And I couldn't put my finger on it. I went to Romans. I went to Galatians. And I prepared a sermon based on Galatians and Romans. And it wasn't what I wanted to preach at all. And I know this feeling. I know this. This is when the Spirit says, you're going the wrong way, idiot. Turn around. And so I did. I literally looked right beside me at my calendar, and didn't you know today is MLK Day? <sighs> I said, ah, you know what the job of a preacher is? To look at those great preachers who came before, like Paul, like John, like Jesus, and make their words relevant to today. And so I started listening to the sermons of Dr. King. And I wanted to play each and every one of them. I just wanted to say, you know what? I'm not giving a sermon today because how do you stand in the shoes of such a great man? How do you stand in his shadow? Because he gave some amazing sermons, but you know what? I could say the same thing about the book of James. The book of James is one great big sermon. And I could just stand up here and read it. So instead, I decided to plagiarize heavily, like all good preachers do. And I went through a transcript of Dr. King's 1958 58 speech, Paul's letter to the American churches. In it, Dr. King imagines that the Apostle Paul is writing to the churches here in America in 1958. And he tells us, just like John, how we've lost our way and how we can find it again. Because Paul wrote a lot of letters like that. One thing that we think of is that we live in a Christian nation. And isn't it wonderful we live in a nation that's based on our Christian values? And I hear that preached from pulpit across, from coast to coast. And you know, I keep thinking it's wrong. And this is me. This is not Dr. King. But our American system of government, governance was not based on the Bible. It was not based on Christianity at all. It's based on the Roman Republic. 
and the Roman Republic is not, was not Christian, it was pagan. And it was an empire built on slavery. It was an empire ruled by white people who brought brown people from other countries and said, now you're gonna come here and serve us. Now, doesn't that sound familiar, America? Whew. That's what we built our nation in the shadow of. We were never a Christian nation, but that doesn't mean that we can't become one. And that's what Dr. King was trying to tell us. We should be a Christian nation. And if we were a Christian nation, then we would pattern our lives after Romans 2.12, which says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now to do this, we can't look to the American Constitution. We can't look to the Declaration of Independence. We can't look to what our Senate is doing right now. We have to turn to the scriptures, to the teaching of Jesus, to base our morality on that of heaven, not on systems of power or popular opinion or the tireless lobbying of corporations for the pursuit of wealth of ill-gotten gain is the root of all evil. Dr. King noted that in his day, one-tenth of one percent of the population controls more than 40 percent of the wealth in this country. Ah! Today, <laughs> no, today, it's more like 80 percent of the wealth in this country. It has only gotten worse since 1958. Dr. King implored we work within the framework of democracy to bring about a better distribution of wealth. Mm -hmm. Now, doesn't that sound a bit un-American? Doesn't that sound a bit anti-capitalist? Now, Dr. King was an anti-capitalist, but he was anti the 1% hoarding all the wealth. Here are his words. He said... You can use your powerful economic resources to wipe poverty from the face of the earth. God never intended for a group of people to live in superfluous, inordinate wealth while others live in abject, deadening poverty. God intends for all his children to have the basic necessities of life, and he has left in this universe enough and to spare for that purpose. Where would he have gotten this idea, I wonder? Just look to the book of Acts, where Peter eliminates poverty among the Christians in Jerusalem by applying the teachings of Jesus. If we were truly a Christian nation, there would be no poverty among us. We would not be able to bear it. Peter, and this is what every new Christian asks their pastor, their elders. Didn't Peter set up a communist system because every Christian in Jerusalem gave everything they had to Peter and Peter redistributed according to the people's needs? But he made sure there was no poverty in Jerusalem, every person there was fed. Every person had a place to live. And if we were a nation built in Christ's image, if we were as we claim to be, this nation would not have any poverty. If moral change is to happen in our nation, if we are to be made in that image, and it is to start among the churches, then we must act as a unified whole. As Dr. King noted, there are over 250 Protestant denominations in America. The tragedy, as he says, is not so much that you have a multiplicity of denominations, but that most of them are warring against each other with a claim to absolute truth. 
<laughs> I am not calling for uniformity, America. I am calling for unity. Those are two very different things. We can all put different names above our church doors. And that's fine. That's normal. Because we don't all agree on the truth. But we do all agree that we are Christians and we still have to be in fellowship. Dr. King continues, this narrow sectarianism is destroying the unity of the body of Christ. You must come to see that God is not a Baptist. God is not a Methodist. God is not a Presbyterian. God is not an Episcopalian. And God is not a Catholic, nor is God of the Church of Christ, or at least not the Church of Christ alone. God is bigger than all our denominations. You know, when the Church of Christ was first starting, there was a saying, we are Christians only, but we are not the only Christians. And that was true in 1850, and it's still true today. And anyone that claims we are the only Christians, we can be fairly certain they're the only ones who aren't. Amen. The body of Christ is one. No church has a monopoly on the truth because truth comes by the Spirit to each and every Christian. Reasonable minds often differ as the Spirit of truth shows each one what is right for them. There can be no such thing as infallibility in this world. No church has a monopoly on truth because no church can contain it all in its multifaceted glory. God is bigger than the whole of creation and certainly bigger than any one denomination. We must recognize the truth in one another and work together in unity. I believe this with my whole heart that God wants one church, and it doesn't matter what you call each and every building, but we are one. Today, just as in Dr. King's day, we are torn apart by race, class, religion, and politics. There are hate groups using the Bible to justify their repugnant ideologies. We must not let them control the meaning of the gospel. Jesus proclaimed the good news that the kingdom of God is here among us. How can that be good news if the kingdom is ruled by hate? How can it be good news if people are being cast out of the kingdom? For Paul wrote to the Galatians that in Christ Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, man nor woman, for we are all one in the body of Christ. Now, doesn't that sound like the things that are dividing us politically today? Race, gender, class, all the things that divide us. And Paul was writing about it 2,000 years ago, that we have to support one another along all these lines. Concerning race, Paul proclaimed to the Athenians, God who made the world, made of one blood all nations of humanity to dwell on all the face of the earth. Whether you take the stories of Adam and Noah figuratively or literally, it's clear that it is the intention of our creator that we consider ourselves one race, one family. And that's what Dr. King was trying to tell us 50 years ago. For those who would tear our family apart, who would use violence as their weapon, they spew their hate from every corner, wherever they find a platform. They incite violence, attacking peaceful assemblies, wherever they, whether they be drag shows, pride events, marches for racial equality, for women's equality, for the rights of transgender people to simply be who they genuinely are. And when they don't get their way, they assault our institutions, they assault our government. They riot in the streets, they riot at the Capitol. Violence is the weapon of this world. 
but it is not the weapon of a Christian. We are called to bless those who persecute us, to never repay evil for evil, to make every effort to bring about peace and mutual edification. Yes, this may cause us to suffer, even as Jesus suffered, even as Paul suffered, even as Dr. King suffered. But in blessing those who persecute us, we exhaust their evil. We deny them the fuel that they need to perpetuate their hatred. How can you hate someone who has never done you any harm? How can you hate someone who blesses you? Jesus was hung on a cross for challenging the powers of this world. Paul was put in prison for, for proclaiming the love of God. And Dr. King was shot for proclaiming that there are no barriers between races, that just like Paul said, we are one race, we are one family, we are all descended from Adam, from Noah, and we are all to consider ourselves as such, brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> Today we still struggle against the powers of evil with the weapons that our Savior gave us, peace and hope in a world that proclaims our worthlessness, brotherhood in a world that would divide us, love in a world that hates us, joy in a world of darkness. So I pray, proclaim to you the good news. The kingdom of God is here, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. Amen. Amen. Amen.